G'day folks, welcome to the channel that exposes false teachers as well as church grifters, hucksters and charlatans. In this video, I want to play you a clip where a filthy rich South African pastor tells his congregation that food shortages are coming to South Africa. And this is true, food shortages, mass food shortages are coming to millions of people in South Africa. And then he says that he has received a word from God about it. And he says this, that God has told him that if you tithe, then you won't experience these food shortages. But if you don't tithe, then you will suffer from these food shortages. I want to play you this clip and then afterwards I want to show you how what he says is the total opposite of what he should have said according to the Bible, according to the Word of God. Let's get right into it. Here's this clip from this filthy rich South African pastor. I've got a message from God for you, and it's in the Word. There's hardship coming. You hear the rumors of food shortages and all of that, and it's getting, becoming more and more and more. The ones that tithe, those things will not touch you. Are you hearing that? You are in the ark financially. You are in the ark financially. Those that are not tithing, you are in danger of those things that are coming. Doesn't matter if you're a child of God or not a child of God. There are principles in this book. If you do the principles in this book, it can never fail. It can never fail. It can never fail. What is your first act of faith when you get born again? Is to pay your tithe. Is your first act of faith. Because you never paid your tithe. Dear God, this is my money. I work for it. And I'm even upset when the tax man is taking so much. Then I growl at him. And when the diesel price or the petrol price goes up. So your first act of faith as a child of God is to pay your tithe. Is your first act of faith. Because you give it to God by faith. Trusting the word by faith. Are you hearing that? There, there are even, even a leader with us. He is struggling at this stage. I said, go and pull these records for me. No tithing. I said, the man is getting what he, what he was looking for. I can't help him. I can't help him. Because he knew the truth, but he went against the truth. So that is the word that I've got for some. So if it's not applicable to you, just shrug it off and carry on like you do. If it's applicable to you, repent. Repent doesn't mean I say, God, I'm sorry. That means you never tithe, you in this direction. Repent means to turn around and go in the opposite direction. So you were in this direction, you never tithe. Now you hear the word, you repent. You say, hey, I'm in the opposite direction. And you become a tither and a victorious financial independent like us. That is what repent means. Doesn't mean to say, I'm sorry. It means to do the opposite that you went in. Okay, I had to say that because otherwise the Spirit would not have leave me. I love you. Not that the Spirit is ever going to leave me, but I mean leave me that I can get off this platform. What that pastor said is the total opposite of what he should have said. If that man was truly a man of God, who, who truly loved God and loved God's people, then he would have stood up on that platform and said, listen, Food shortages are coming to South Africa, but we are going to do everything we can to make sure that you and your family 
get enough food. That's what he should have done, right? That's what he should have said. The idea that some leader in his church comes to the church and says, look, I don't have enough food. And he says, look, have you been tithing? Well, if you haven't been tithing, uh, we can't help you. I can't help you. That's just ridiculous. As Christians, that's not the attitude that we should have. We should have an attitude of, of love and of grace and of mercy because that's what God has shown us, right? I mean, it's not his money. It's the money that people have been giving to the church. And really, it should be used to help the poor. He should have said this. He should have said, look, we will do everything we can, even if we have to sell church assets and and grow crops on the church premises. We're going to do everything we can to make sure that you and your family get enough food. That's what he should have said, right? That's that's the Christian attitude. Even if you have to sell that multi-million dollar building that they're all in and, and meet in homes just to get the money to, to meet the needs of the people and others and to be a witness for Christ, he should have said, we, we are willing to do that. That's what he should have said. You know, there's there's some really interesting passages in the Bible that I want to share with you. And the first one is in Acts chapter 11, where a very similar situation occurred, right? This is Acts chapter 11, verse 27 uh, to 30. Let me read this to you. It says this, Now in those days, some prophets came down to them from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them named Agabus stood up and indicated by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine all over the world. And this took place in the reign of Claudius. So we've got a situation here where a prophet's come down from Jerusalem to Antioch and one of those prophets, Agabus, stands up and says, look, there's going to be a, a famine throughout the world. And then listen to the response of, of the people. And as any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the service of the brothers living in Judea. And this they did, sending it in the charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. What was the response of the, the believers in Antioch? Was the, the response of the believers in Antioch, look, those Judean believers, you know, they really need to tithe. And you become a tither and a victorious financial independent like us. No, that wasn't their response. Their response was to gather everything they could and to send a gift to the believers in Judea. Why? Because they obviously felt that they were going to be more affected by this famine than others. But notice as well, it says, as any of the disciples had means, right? Not everybody had the means to give, right? But those that did, they gave to help the poor. Remember in the book of Acts, when they sold their houses and they sold their land and they laid at the apostles' feet, what did they use that money for? They used it to help the poor. But what's really happening with this particular pastor is his concern that when food shortages come, people will give less money to the church, which is perfectly understandable. And so instead of just being understanding and saying, look, we're going to help you, he thinks of himself and his own ministry and he says, you need to tie, though otherwise you're not going to have enough food. He tries to put fear in them to give when really he should be helping them. There's a really interesting passage of Scripture in the book of Acts. I want to take you to it. The book of Acts, and this is um, just before the Apostle Paul is arrested in Jerusalem. He's on his way um, to Jerusalem, and he stops in Miletus, and he calls for the Ephesian church elders. And this is the last time that he's going to see these Ephesian church elders. If you look in Acts chapter 20, verse 17, it says this, now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. So he's in Miletus and he sends a messenger to Ephesus and calls all of the elders to come to him. Now, have a look at verse 29. I'm going to make a, a number of points here and the last points are going to be the most relevant. But all of these points are, I think, very relevant. Let me read to you verse 29. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves... Men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Just because somebody's got a crowd, that doesn't mean that God's with them, right? Because Paul is saying that false teachers draw disciples after them. And that's what they want to do. You see this as well in 2 Peter. It says in chapter 2, many will follow their pernicious ways, right? Let's keep reading. Therefore, be watchful, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. Notice here he's saying, look, 
For, for a period of three years, night and day, with tears, I warned you about false teachers, wolves, savage wolves that would devour the flock. Listen to this. This is verse 33. Listen to this. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to those who were with me. In everything I showed you that by laboring in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Notice here how the Apostle Paul uses the words of Jesus, it's more blessed to give than to receive. He uses them to admonish the Ephesian church elders, the Ephesian church pastors, to work with their hands as he worked with his hands so that they would have something to share with those who were needy. That, that's how the Apostle Paul used the words of Jesus. It's more blessed to give than to receive. He uses it in the total opposite way that these pastors use it. These pastors use it to tell the poor people that they should give money to them. That's, they use it in the total opposite way. It's just crazy and mind-boggling that they would do this. And to be honest, it's mind-boggling that people don't even see it because it's right here in the Bible. You see, in New Testament times, poor people didn't support their local church and their pastor, right? Usually, they met in homes, the homes of rich people, and those rich people were patrons of the pastors and of the church. Whether it be uh, wealthy women or wealthy men, they would support the local church and the pastor, and not everybody in the church gave. That's some people did, and there were times where people even gave out of their poverty. But every time you see that, it's always people giving out of their poverty to help somebody else in need, right? So, for example, you have them, these believers in Macedonia in their poverty helping to put a contribution together for the poor saints in Jerusalem who were even poorer. And it's in that context that Paul says God loves a cheerful giver. That's what it's about. You see the Philippians putting money together and sending a monetary gift to help Paul because Paul was in desperate need and they helped him even when he was rotting in prison because you know in prison the Romans didn't feed you. They didn't look after you. You relied on the charity of others. So you can see that taking place there. And so it's very clear here that um, this passage of Scripture warns us here in the book of Acts, warns us of ravenous wolves who will devour the flock. And I think that that man, in my opinion, is a ravenous wolf seeking to devour the flock. He's doing the opposite of what he should be doing as a pastor. Now, it's really quite interesting. There's this really incredible debate on YouTube about tithing. And if you haven't watched it, I want to encourage you, watch this debate on tithing. I'm going to put a link to it in the description. The guy who uh, debates against the idea that Christians have to tithe in the New Testament, he, uh, his name is Russell, Dr. Russell Kelly. He did his PhD in tithing. This man knows more about the subject of tithing than anybody else on the face of the earth, in my opinion. He is such a learned man when it comes to the issue of tithing that I've just never seen anybody uh, um, be able to open up the scriptures on the subject of tithing like this man. And I've put a link to the description in the video below. And let me tell you, you want to watch this debate. He absolutely annihilates the other guy trying to argue that tithing is something for New Testament Christians. Well, I hope you've liked this video. If you have, please consider subscribing. Give me a thumbs up. Hit the bell notification button. I'll see you in the comment section and you'll see me in my next video.